Ahoy! Joe Buddy Hambone here, and I'm back again with a brand new coupon code from our friends over at Noble Night Games. That code is VRPG21, and it is good from February the 15th all the way through March 31st, and it's good for 10% off any size order. You heard me right, Noble Night is back, bring in the heat with 10% off any size order. Good from the 15th of February all the way through March 31st. Never been a better time than now to pick up some games. And hey, if you got some older games that you need to clear out to make space for those new games, Noble Knight's got you covered with a killer trading program. You can learn more about that at noblenight.com. And in the meantime, don't forget if you're shopping at Noble Knight to use our code VRPG21 to get 10% off any size order from February 15th through the 31st of March. From our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. Just when I think he can't find anything new under the sun, he overturns a rock, Stu Horvath. (laughs) You know, it's funny. I feel the same way. Like, I periodically sink into this feeling that, like, oh, I've found everything. I know the score. There's nothing. There's nothing going to surprise me. And then... I'm surprised. I passed this on to you, having been surprised by it earlier this week. So, like, it's it's kind of crazy. And for those of you who aren't in our heads and know what we're talking about already, <laughs> we're talking about a actual lost classic in the fantasy genre, a little short film called Black Angel. So I was working on the book, and I was talking, I'm trying to write about the Conan module, and just in talking about the Conan D&D module, sort of bringing in the idea that, like, the 80s was sort of this weird moment for fantasy films, and I was just kind of going through lists, trying to find as many fantasy films as possible to sort of see if, like, if my feeling was that there were more fantasy films in the 80s than any other period before or since. Because there wasn't much before then. It was like Harryhausen movies and like the Hercules movies. And that's kind of it. This all besides the point. I see this name, 1980, Black Angel. What is that? I've never heard of that movie. And it's got a cool name, Black Angel. It, there should be like a, a Sisters of Mercy sound cue whenever I hear see the name. And so I look into it and I, all of a sudden I remember what this is. Now, I'm going to bring you back to when I was at the New York Daily News So like 2006, 2007, I remember, you know, at the Daily News, I was a photo editor and and I had a lot of time to kill. And I used that time just clicking aimlessly on the internet. And I remember reading about on like a forum or something, a bunch of people trying to figure out if there was a movie that ran before Empire Strikes Back. I distinctly remember this. The guy was sort of like, I remember seeing it in theaters in England and there was another movie in front of it, what they call a program where, and, and the Pixar movies do this a lot where they have like the short in front of the movie to kind of warm you up. And they remember sort of like a sword and sorcery fantasy film before Empire Strikes Back. And no one else knew, knew what this poor guy was talking about to the point where like at the end of the thread, he was just like, I must have been wrong. I must be making this up. Like he Mandela affected himself. <laughs> Oh, no. Right? I didn't think anything of that until several years later when the news breaks that they find the lost negative of this film in some archive or something. And I'm I'm looking at the, I'm like, whoa, hold on a second. That movie was actually real. That guy in England knew what he was talking about. Yeah, that had to be such a vindicating moment for that dude on the internet. Maybe he never knows, but I'm sure he does. I'm sure like when they announced it somewhere on some nerd forum that he was on OG back in the day, he was probably like, yeah, (laughs) told him. (laughs) They didn't listen to me, but I knew. The story goes something like this. George Lucas wants a program for the release. So he commissions Roger Christian. Who is an Academy Award winning production and set designer. Like he did work on the original Star Wars. He did work on Alien. Like the look of the Nostromo and the oh, look God. of a lot of stuff in those old Star Wars ships, that's all Roger Christian. Yeah. 
So like guy has an aesthetic and he asks Christian to make a film. Well, he was looking for a program and Roger Christian had written this short film and Lucas greenlights it, gives him a budget and sends him up to Scotland for like, I guess like a week or two to, to film this thing. Gave him 25 grand, slapped him on the ass and said, go make me a program, sir. Right. 1979, you know, and they were all in England because they were working on Empire Empire Strikes Strikes Back. Back. And then they put it in front of Empire Strikes Back when it came out. But they only really did it in in England. It wasn't really in the States. And then it just kind of disappears. I don't know why. There's an intro. If you look, if you watch the film on YouTube, it's on YouTube. Uh, It's also on iTunes. If you watch it on YouTube, Christian does like a video intro and... (laughs) He seems really unbothered by the fact that like, like this piece of thing, you know, work that he put his time and energy into just sort of vanished for 20 years. It's like, eh, whatever. We found it. I mean, he did win an Oscar in between. So true, it's not like, true. you know, he had nothing else going on. It's like, oh, this is my lost classic that, you know, I only had one shot here. It's like, well, you, you kind of won multiple Oscars. So you, you did okay for yourself there. But so, of course, as soon as I learn about this thing, I have to watch it. And man, it's really good. Like, I didn't really expect it to be good. Not only did I not expect it to be really good, I didn't expect it to feel like a Star Wars movie in ways that I have trouble expressing. And it's all down to, like you said, you know, Christian was working as the art director on on these films. So like, there's something of Star Wars in this medieval drama you know, just because it's like like his eye is sort of putting it all together. But it's it's really strange because like you don't expect to get like like vague Star Wars feel from like a, a King Arthur story, you know? Watching this, if you just slide everything that happens in Empire on Dagobah from sci-fi space fantasy to just like straight up fantasy, it's practically the same thing. In fact, this is something that it was said that Lucas was so taken by this. That's why the Dagobah stuff on Empire looks the way that it does. I like the weird stuttery kind of slow motion thing. Yeah, the, the, you feel like you're on drugs and Luke's having a fever <laughs> dream kind of stuff that you see in Empire. And I mean, it is, you're looking at it and you're like, this is this is Star Wars, but with swords. And not like laser swords, like actual swords yeah. made of metal. I was floored by this. It's a very slow burn. I mean, it's only 22 minutes, essentially. Yeah. And it does take you on a journey in that 22 minutes where, like, now, you know, you can't really fathom what it is to have a program in front of a movie. Like, the Pixar stuff, yes, I understand that. But the Pixar stuff is, like, five, seven minutes. Like, this is, like, an episode of television that you are going to watch before you watch the movie. (laughs) And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, like, man, this would have wrapped up, and I would have been sitting there in the theater like, well, I kind of feel like I got my money's worth already. What else are you going to show me? And, and, okay, it was the Empire Strikes Back, man. But, like, (laughs) nonetheless, like, I can't encourage people enough to go and watch this. on Because it's free. It's on YouTube. Just go. When you finish this episode, obviously, if you're driving, pull over first. But you should go (laughs) check this out. It's eerie. It is haunting and definitely worth the watch. It really is. The plot synopsis is super, you know, short. (laughs) Guy comes back from the Crusades, finds his home is ruined, encounters this woman who kind of saves his life and then finds out that she's bound to this black angel. And he's like, well, I'll rescue you. And hijinks ensue. And then that's it. (laughs) There's all these beautiful long shots of Scotland. I guess it's by Elaine Donnan Castle. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm shaming my Scottish ancestors. But real gorgeous wilderness shots. The costuming is really good. There's only five people in the movie. And the Black Angel is spooky and covered in cobwebs. And this moment where, like, it's sort of slow motion and they're fighting and you feel, you know, like a life and death struggle. But then sort of the Black Angel sort of disappears out of the frame and the guy is just sort of fighting cobwebs. It's almost like they're underwater. It's so cool. I've never seen anything like that before. And it, and it was all just practical camera work. There's no special effects in it. It's just like the way they did the slowdown and the way they they framed everything. Like they kind of just move the bad guy out of the frame as if he wasn't there to begin with. It's so cool. Yeah, there's a lot of illusion in this movie where they're like alluding to like kind of like a person at the end of their life losing their faculties or they're losing like alluding to a person's like day-to-day struggles and like you know trying to overcome and escape the inevitable while like having a shot for shot walkthrough of the Frazetta Museum <laughs> because there's some shots in there I'm like is that the death dealer 
<laughs> black angel on that horse i don't know kind of looks eerily like the death dealer yeah. like it is a frazetta painting come to life and done in a way where like the combat is almost like kind of watching like a, a samurai film yeah and very like methodical to every strike very very impressed with this like i watched it twice actually yesterday because i watched it once you know, as we normally watch things now where like your phone's going off, your things are happening around you in your own world. And then I got through it and I, I sat there and I was like, huh. And then I just turned my phone off for 22 minutes. And I put it back on. And I watched it again. And it's something that I think like deserves multiple watches and multiple viewings because I missed a lot. Even like half paying attention to it, I still missed a lot. So definitely like this is a turn your phone off kind of thing and dig into a piece of like, odd rpg sci-fi history that really we didn't know existed yeah it's long on metaphor man like that sort of makes it arthurian without like ever actually mentioning king arthur or anything like it just sort of taps into that like this story is about what it is on the surface but it's also about like six or seven other things that like you don't quite notice on the first viewing and it has like this really perfect like early 80s, late 70s, early 80s feel to it. It's just so right in line with the genre movies that were coming out right around then. It like, it just slots right in there and, and feels good. I feel like I've covered like a piece of movie history watching it. It's so, you know, the, the gritty and vibrant and cool. I have a hard time expressing what it is that I find so fascinating about it. But I think that it, you're right. Everybody should watch this thing because it's like it comes right out of the same sort of genre tradition that so much of, you know, role playing games is tied up in. And like, how often do you get to see something from the 80s for the first time? You know, I feel like so much of it is we've watched things over and over and over again. But right now, my kid is watching Return of the Jedi basically every day. Oh, I love it. <laughs> when, I love it so much. Gets, <laughs> when he gets home from school, he's just like like every day. Return of the Jedi. And it's like, I, I like that movie a lot. I think that I like it more now in a way, but I also hate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Black Angel is like a breath of like <laughs> very fresh old air, you know? I mean, it could be worse for you, buddy. The, the furry things that he's watching are Ewoks. It could be Paw Patrol. <laughs> True. I mean, there's a reason why we're watching Star Wars stuff. Listen, no matter how cool a dad is, you know that dad knows exactly what a Zoomer is. <laughs> so one fun fact about this, you know, as I was stumbling down my research on it, uh, yes, I actually did research for once. I Googled <laughs> stuff. So in 2015, you know, Roger Christians was so excited about getting the film back, they actually put together an Indiegogo campaign to make a feature length version of this movie. You know, they raised about 170, oh no, in, in US dollars, they raised about $145,000, but got some backers, got John Rice Davies to be in the film, because of course, who, who else are you going to cast in a fantasy film? <laughs> you know, they had the whole thing ready to go and then got their backers, got their ducks in a row and then COVID happened. So- oh. Yeah, it's still happening, though. They basically announced earlier this year that, like, hey, we have the money to do this, but we don't have the money to cover COVID production costs. Yeah, because nobody that, does. <laughs> that's a very different kind of party nowadays where you have to have a certain COVID coverage for your productions, which includes, like, X amount of other stuff, which is making television, movies, any other production – exponentially more expensive so is going to happen they're just kind of waiting it out a little bit longer i'm very curious to see what they do with it i mean i think i want to believe that this is the person who brought it to life the first time and is coming back to actually give it its due and gets kind of a do-over on something that was lost to time up until now so i'm kind of curious to see what it is i mean look John Rice Davies, we know who we're getting into bed with there. We know the kind of fantasy we're going to get out of this yeah. movie. And I'm curious to see what Black Angel would be like with a larger budget and actually like a full length movie. Uh, I would really love to see them continue in that tradition of samurai style cinematic combat, which I think is very kind of refreshing in a lot of ways where, you know, I just watched the Schneider cut of the Justice League, all four hours of it the other day. Huh. And it's one of those things where, you know, and this is not even to go down that trail and talk about the Schneider cut, but modern movies, as it were, it's a lot of fast, fast, faster 
combat and then like slow, slow, slow combat, back to fast, up combat. You know, there is a real lost art to combat in movies nowadays where it's gotten to the point where, you know, back when it was John Woo stylistically doing combat and then it's gotten bastardized to be like, I'm watching this and I feel like I should be smashing a triangle button. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm watching a, a quick time event in a video game. So I would love to see this come back with that slow aesthetic, with a budget, with some killer monster design, because the, the Black Angel design in this was, I mean, it was Frazetta. So it was amazing. So <laughs> I would love to see what that looks like on the big screen in 2020, whatever year it'll be when it comes out. Yeah. I feel like a lot of action in contemporary movies is all about velocity and there's no weight behind it. And there was this video on editing practices that I watched a million years ago, and it talked about throwing punches. And like in the 70s and 80s, you would actually see the visual of the punch being thrown and landing like three different times, you know, in quick succession from a couple different angles to really like sell the impact. And I miss that from, you know, modern stuff. Like there's a beauty to it. Like John Wick is awesome. The way he dances through a nightclub, killing everybody. It's beautiful. But like Black Angel has this, you could feel the heaviness of the swords, you know? Yeah. You could feel the weight of every strike and how much work it was for the characters to do it. Like literal fighting for their lives. So yeah, I don't know if you could tell this, but we cannot recommend you watch this for free on YouTube enough. <laughs> Get in on it. Get on the ground floor or something. Check out something cool that we had no idea existed until now. And, you know, dig a little deeper into your RPG history. Yeah. Pretty cool. It does bum me out a little bit that Black Angel didn't get its sort of share of cinematic history. I feel like we'd be living in a slightly different world if it was a little more widely disseminated. Well, all I know is the courier who was handling it and who lost it definitely got fired that day. So, <laughs> you know, it sucks to be that guy. So, Stu, do you have any final thoughts on Black Angel? It's free. Go watch it. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like, don't fight us on this. So this is another awesome episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can people find you? They can find me every day on Instagram at Vintage RPG, where I'm posting about role-playing games. I don't really post about movies, but occasionally I podcast about them. And there you go. You can find me on the Twitter and on Instagram at John McGuire RPG. I changed all my socials. Now I'm John McGuire RPG, and it's easier to find me everywhere. You follow my day-to-day -day adventures, podcasting life. I tweet about board games. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about Dungeons & Dragons and other RPGs at John McGuire RPG. If you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. If you really like the show, why not become a patron? Patreon.com slash Vintage RPG. We've got a behind-the-scenes look at Stu's book. We've got a behind-the-scenes look at my RPGs that I've been writing. We've also got early release episodes and a killer Discord community that we'd love for you all to be a part of. Patreon.com slash VintageRPG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 